Connors T, how are ye? Welcome to another episode of the Candlelit Tales podcast and the Goddess series that we've just started. If you haven't seen our Imbolc special, go onto YouTube and find some beautiful animations from three very special artists. And now we have another collaboration, a special episode given to us by Lauren Legends, Rick Scott. We'll be chatting about this episode with Rick at the end of the month and we'll have another Goddess story before then. This podcast is supported by Patreon. People have gone to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales to support in whatever way they can. But for now, the Ren Bird and the Manx legend of Tehi Tegi. Hey Rick, tell us a story, will you? This tale comes from the Kingdom of Man, which lies between Wales and Ireland. They too have a story which reveals the nature of the Wren. For they say that when that famous Saint Machold came to that isle, it lay still within the power of the fairy folk. From the moment that he stepped upon the northern shore of man, near Ramsey he was met by the friars of that isle, and they helped this desperate man, who was emaciated from lack of food or drink, and who carried everywhere on his back the coracle in which he had washed onto the shore, and to which he was manacled by a chain at his foot. And when they had nursed him back to health, Macol told the other friars of the island that it was in his heart to travel all over the island, testifying to the power of Christ and calling all who would listen towards salvation. But Germanus, the leader of the friars in that place, shook his head and told him that although some had heeded the call of Christ, the Isle of Man was still a cursed place overrun by fairies. The people of the island were bound to one of the old race, the Tour de Danan, and her name was Tehi Teki. Tehi Teki was a fey queen, and a great enchantress, who by her clear and beautiful voice and her shining face bewitched the hearts of all who heard or saw her, especially the menfolk. And every year she took a tithe from among the men of the island, causing a handful of them to follow her entranced as she walked across the land, until at last she led them down into the sea and they were drowned. In this way, she displayed her dominion over the island. But Machold was not perturbed. If a man like me can abandon himself to God, the people of the island can do it also. And so Machold went out amongst the people, preaching. I myself was a stranger to God, he told them. My name then was Makul. And I was a pirate and brigand who raided across the shores of Ireland. I considered myself to be a powerful man. And one day I heard that St. Patrick, that holy man of God, was travelling around the island performing miracles. And I fought to make a fool out of him. So I had one of my men take him a message, saying that one of our gang was dead and entreating him with false earnesty to restore this man to life. And when we heard that he was coming, we had one of our brothers lay beneath a burial shroud, though he was still living. The holy man came amongst us, and we struggled to contain our laughter. But Patrick, he said nothing at all, but simply reached out and touched the toe of our brother beneath the shroud, Then he turned, and he left. But our laughter died in our throats when we pulled back the shroud and found our brother cold, without any breath in his body. And we wailed and despaired, for we did love him dearly, and I felt a great weight of shame press upon me. It was not myself, but my friend Connor, 
knowing what was in all of our hearts, who found the humility to seek out Patrick again, give him profound apologies, and beg God's forgiveness. Connor brought Patrick back with him to the camp, and all of my men fell on their knees before him. He took water, and he baptised all of them. And then he went into the tent where our dead brother lay and spoke a blessing over him. And the dead man sat up, casting off the shroud, and was wholly alive again. Well, all there were baptised now, save for myself, for my shame, and still my pride, prevented me from coming out of my tent and approaching him. But Patrick came and stood before my tent, and he called me out, chastised me not only for the wickedness I practised in my own life, but for leading all these other men who I claim to love and call brothers toward damnation. His words, they pierced me, and I asked the holy man, what must I do to make reparation? You must give up everything that you have, he said, and throw yourself upon God's mercy. And Patrick baptised me, and told me that my name now was not McCool, but Mackold. And then he had a chain brought, and a coracle that was made from wicker. And he fixed one end of the chain by a padlock to my foot, and the other end to the boat. And he took the key to that padlock, and he threw it into the river Boyne, saying to me that I must never loose the chain until the key was found and brought to me. And I laid down in that boat, and I let myself be washed out to sea. I drifted for days and nights, thinking that God had surely forsaken me and that I was destined to die, until I was washed ashore on the headland of this island. And I knew that God had given me a purpose, to serve him and share his mercy with you so that you might know the same joy and gratitude that lives every day in my heart. And so listen to me when I say, you are all of you better off with God. This woman whom you worship, Tehi Teki, is a wicked spirit, a witch. Her voice is enchanting to hear, yet it betrays the righteous and the good. It is like this. When the first followers of the risen Christ began to preach his resurrection, there was one in Jerusalem called Stephen, who was sentenced to death for defeating the teachings of the Pharisees, performing signs and miracles, and because to them he said, Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. As Stephen fled from the crowd and the soldiers which sought to have him stoned, he came to the city's northern gate, where he heard a beautiful songbird calling to him out of a furze bush, and so he leapt inside. But no sooner was Stephen inside the bush than the wren which had called him hopped out, warbling furiously, and the soldiers, alerted, found Stephen there and dragged him out. As the soldiers threw him down before the crowd, Stephen threw back his head and cried, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. His words enraged the people who threw down their coats and scrabbled about for stones that they could kill him with. And as the stones flew from their hands, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And as they struck him and he fell on his knees, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And saying this, he was laid down and he fell asleep forever. (laughs) 
so it is with Tehi Teki. She is like the wren, which sings so beautifully, who has such cunning wiles, but a coward's heart. And this is how St. Macold preached to the folk of the island of Man, walking from place to place with his coracle upon his back and the chain clinking at his heel. And though he spoke with passion, they did not heed him but hated him. Everywhere that he went, he spoke prayers and performed miracles against the Fey folk. Casting down idols, throwing out the people's offerings, disturbing the fairy rings and throwing down druid stones so that their anger and their fear was ever increasing. And that year, the power of Tehi Teki did not diminish, but it increased. Her song grew louder and louder on the mournful breeze, and pierced so deep into their hearts that they forgot everything else in the world. All sorrow and care, home and country, till at last everything in the island came to a standstill. Their haggards were empty, for they neither ploughed nor sowed, and their houses were ruins, for they neither built nor mended. They cut no turf, gathered no wood for their fires. Their fields were covered with stones, so that the cattle died for want of pasture, and their gardens were full of weeds. There was a strange stillness throughout the island. No children's voices were to be heard anywhere. And no man was found who could rouse himself for any woman except for Tehi Teki. They glimpsed her in their dreams or from the corner of their eye. Through a gap in the trees, a crack in the barn door and always she was there smiling at them. And she would begin to sing. They would try to follow her, and she allowed it, firing each one with the conviction that she would choose them from amongst all others to be her lover. And this continued until it came the day when Tehi Teki took her tithe, and on the far horizon she appeared on a milk-white horse, shod with shoes of gold, with bit of gold and bridle set with jewels, with a saddle of mother of pearl and a saddle cloth of blue. Tehi Teki mounted, and the waves of her golden hair flowed down over her dress of shining white. She rode, and took her way under shady trees and through grassy lanes, where bluebells and primroses grew as thick as the grass, and the hedges were yellow with gorse. She went on by fields covered with stones, which were once fine cornland. And on she went by lonely little dwellings, whose roofs had sunk in on the hearth. And then by spots where houses once had been, but now were marked only by jenny nettles or an old roan tree. And everywhere that she passed, the boys and the men came out of their homes the dawn fire bright in their eyes. And heedless of the cries of their wives, sisters and mothers, they drifted out of their arms into the wake of Tehi Teki's train. It was not just a few this time. It was all. In swelling numbers they gathered behind her horse till there were six hundred men or more. Tehi Teki never looked at a single one of them, but she smiled radiantly and triumphantly as she led them over the summits of the island. Her way mounted upwards, amongst hills shining in the sunlight, and through gills where little streams ran down between banks covered with fern and briar and many a flower. And as they walked, thick mists rolled down, between the mountains of Jarmine and Moraun, deep groans were heard from the tombs of the ancient Manx kings. Even as the wind swelled with the blistering beauty of Tehi Teki's voice, the sky above grew heavy and pregnant with her words, 
and eagles, kites and cormorants, burst from the clouds to swoop and circle and voice fatal warning cries. And these cries were joined from below by the keening of women, who now were gathering upon the rocky skirts and escarpments of the valley, the abandoned womenfolk of the island, who gazed with dismay down into the valley at the fairy queen who led their stolen husbands, fathers and brothers in the damned procession. And neither river nor brook impeded the course of Tehi Teki, and she led them all to the side of the swift river that ran between those hills, the Awindu or Dark River and her white palfrey forded or swam those waters, eagerly pursued by the crowd of her reckless lovers. Beneath their feet, the waters seemed as clear as glass and as smooth as snow. As heedless of their safety, they followed her over the banks and into the heart of the river. There, Tehi Teki stopped and she turned to face her army of admirers, who even now saw her shining brighter and more beautiful than she had ever appeared to them before. All of them were staring towards her, and yet their eyes were blind and unseen. All, that is, except one man. One man had followed her, but he was not entranced and he stood staring at the Enchantress with a grim and sober countenance. This man was dressed astorely in a sackcloth and a cloak, and the wicker coracle he carried on his back was chained to his foot. It was Macholt, the only man on the island whom the Fairy Queen had not bewitched. And as Tehi Teki's gaze turned to meet his, Machold raised his voice, and he began to fling out curses towards the woman. Out, fairy, I know what you are. A witch, an enchantress, a sorcerer. Your magic has no strength against the power of Almighty God. And Machold spoke his own charms, the Latin of the mass, and as their power rung out, the binding of Tehi Teki's glamour began to weaken. The men around him began to gasp, blinking their eyes like those who had just been shaken out of sleep. Yet Tehi Teki showed no rage, and she took no fright. Instead she smiled, and she raised her hand. And in an instant the wind rose, and the sky filled with clouds, and the waters of the river reared up in a great and tumultuous wave, which crashed down upon the heads of the six hundred men, sweeping them away. Tehi Teki was untouched, the surging water a venomous cyclone around the place where she stood atop her milk-white palfrey. The water swirled around and away from Tehi Teki, but from Makhold also they bent away. Most of the men were drowned instantly, but some of those who had woken reached out and grabbed the hem of the holy man's robe or the edge of the wicker coracle which had fallen from his back and floated now on the swirling currents of the water that whipped around them. And holding on to Makhold and to this boat, this handful of men were saved from their fight. And for all of the violence of the whirlwind around him, Makhold stood his ground and called out to Tehi Teki. I name you as Freya, who wears a cloak of birds' feathers and gathers up the dead. I name you Kalak N. Grumak, who comes as a bird from the sea. 
I name you a Strix, sorceress, most ancient enemy. Foul hag, misshapen bird. With this iron chain and coracle, I bind you in the name of the Lord. All you men, seize her. And as one, Makold and the survivors surged forward with outstretched arms to lay hold of Tehiteki and tear her apart. But as they leapt forward, their hands closed on empty air. In an instant, Tehiteki changed her shape. Her woman's body had melted away, and her substance all folded up into the form of a bird. A wren, which winged swiftly up and away from Mackold's sight. Her white horse melted away beneath her and became a perkin. A dolphin, which dived at once into the river's torrents and vanished down the stream to the place where it joined the sea. The fairy queen was gone, and to this day, they say that the people on the Isle of Man despise this bird, the wren, yet fear to destroy it, lest some calamity befall the person and his family who finally destroy the queen and end her reign there. Others there are who have stronger faith, say that with Makold's last prayer he bound the fairy queen to that form, and to appear on the island yearly and that always she is condemned to die by human hands at the concluding of the hunting of the wren. St. Mackold, meanwhile, returned to the chapel near Ramsey, where he was received by the friars once again, and he served with them as a shepherd to the people of the island for many years grew so beloved of them that when the time came to choose a successor to Germanus, all were unanimous that it should be Macold. All of that time, he still wore the coracle on his back, and on the eve of his ordination, Macold was sharing a meal with the friars when the cook came in from the kitchens with something that was strange to see. He was carrying a key, and he explained that he had found it within the belly of the fish which he was preparing that night for their dinner. One of the friars took the key and looked questioningly at Macold. He nodded, and shaking with emotion, he lifted up his foot as the friar took the key and slipped it into the nook of the padlock. This story was told by Rick Scott of Lore and Legends. You can check out their link in the description below.